Inside a cylindrical shaft bored into a mountain in West Texas, construction is currently underway on the Clock of the Long Now, a colossal mechanism designed to keep time for the next 10,000 years. That length of time was chosen because 10,000 years is about how much time has passed since humans first developed agriculture. Its completion would mark the middle of a 20,000 year period, which its creators call the long now. We can often fail to think in time periods that exceed our own lifetime. Our modern short-sightedness is often given as one of the issues which drives our senseless ransacking of the Earth's ecosystems in pursuit of fleeting riches for us and our shareholders. So, how does it work? The clock doesn't use any digital or electrical components, instead relying on mechanical gears and pendulums to keep time, and for power, the desert's sharp difference in temperature between day and night. The clock's face displays the current year using five digits, as well as the positions of the sun, moon, and night sky. The clock also contains a series of ten chimes and a mechanical computer which calculates a unique order in which to hit them, so that each of the over three million days in 10,000 years gets its own melody. While the actual timekeeping machinery is powered by the temperature difference, in order to update the face and hear the chimes, visitors will need to provide the necessary energy by winding up a great weight. When trying to keep time over such a long period, a number of usually trivial variables suddenly become relevant. At noon every day, the sun shines through a window at the top of the mountain. This synchronizes the clock with the solar noon. Throughout the year, the sun's position at midday moves in a figure-eight pattern called an anilemma. Some normal clocks already face this issue, so there are pre-existing ways of dealing with it. What's harder is accounting for the Earth's axial precession, that's the change in how much the axis tilts, and its reduction in rotational speed over the 10,000 years. Their solution is a specifically engineered cam which gradually rotates over the millennia to account for all of these factors. I think there's something so beautiful about the act of summing up all these complex mathematical problems into one physical object. One of the reasons the clock uses mechanical components instead of digital ones is to make it easier for future generations to reconstruct what the clock was for if it ever stops working. Something similar happened when, in 1901, a piece of corroded metal was found in a shipwreck off the coast of Antikythera, while initially thought to be unremarkable. It later became clear that this fragment had once been part of an archaic mechanical computer which people in ancient Greece used to predict the position of celestial bodies. This Antikythera mechanism featured a technology which we previously didn't know was present in ancient Greece. Precisely manufactured bronze gears. And even though the remains of the machine had been damaged and corroded by millennia underwater, we were still able to reconstruct how the mechanism worked in a way which we wouldn't have been able to had we found a silicon chip at the bottom of the Aegean. The Clock of the Long Now is being built by the aptly named Long Now Foundation, a non-profit founded in 1996 by Stuart Brand, Danny Hillis, and Brian Eno. Their aim is to promote thinking across time spans much greater than a single generation. Brian Eno and Danny Hillis seem to have differing views on whether the clock is primarily a work of art or a practical machine. I think the way we think about the clock now is possibly more as a work of art than as a functioning machine, although it is a functioning machine, or will be. I think of it more as a functioning machine, yeah. Do you? Everyone's favorite CEO entrepreneur born in 1964, Jeffrey Jeffrey Bezos, joined the organization's board of directors in 2005. He's given the organization $42 million, as well as the patch of land in West Texas where the clock is being built. I think there's a clear irony in a project that's meant to promote long-term thinking and solidarity being bankrolled by a capitalist who spent their life hoarding obscene amounts of wealth for themselves. Perhaps it's a small mercy that in a system where it's so hard to do 
anything which isn't deemed profitable. A few projects like this do nonetheless get funding, even if it is at the hand of oligarchs. But lest we forget, the pyramids were built as tombs for god kings. It's interesting to think about the clock in the context of previous things humans have made which have lasted over many thousands of years. In a small French town called Lascaux, there lies a cave system adorned with over 2,000 paintings and engravings done by people who lived about 17,000 years ago. Forgotten until the early 1940s, the cave's stable climate allowed the works to remain basically unchanged for thousands of years. The art mainly depicts animals with some humans and mysterious abstract symbols which some hypothesize might be a form of proto-writing. Plants and scenery are notably absent, as are reindeer, which is strange as this would have been the artist's main source of food. The caves also contain negative hand stencils made by blowing pigment onto an outstretched hand pressed against a wall. In his essay on the cave paintings, John Green says that These hand stencils remind us of how different life was in the distant past, but they also remind us that the humans of the past were as human as we are, their hands indistinguishable from ours. These communities hunted and gathered, and there were no large caloric surpluses, so every healthy person would have had to contribute to the acquisition of food and water, and yet somehow they still made time to create art, almost as if art isn't optional for humans. One of the things I like about Lascaux and about cave art more broadly is its authenticity and its immediacy. As far as we can tell, the people who made them weren't trying to paint ultra-realistic frescoes to live up to some artistic standards imposed from without, nor were they trying to create something deliberately bizarre and subversive of those standards. The art that they created is unself-conscious in the best way possible. It predates all this kind of analysis and commentary about art which would arise in the future. We can't know why the paintings of Lascaux were made or what they meant to their creators, but I think when we consider them alongside the clock of the long now, what we get is two different snapshots of the state and values of human culture 17,000 years apart. The Lascaux paintings are reflective of a hunter-gatherer society, one in which humans are not the masters, one where the environment people interact with on a daily basis is not made by us and is alive and full of magic. The clock, on the other hand, reflects a very different understanding of the world and our place in it. It is a machine, a measuring device, which counts the years with its precisely engineered steel cogs. This is a world which is measurable, which is governed not by magic but by laws of nature. The clock demonstrates our desire to deliberately create something that will withstand the ages, to outsmart entropy with our cunning homage wit. Perhaps 10,000 years from now, a new monument will be built. Something emblematic of a worldview as bizarre to us as a steel beast of gears would be to the painters of Lascaux. Its creators will look back on that ancient clock built by their distant ancestors and remark on how vastly the state of humanity has changed since then. And as with Lascaux, though its creators lived in a foreign time, they were people just like us. Their lives as real and all-encompassing to them as ours are. Both works I've been talking about are situated inside caves. Lascaux's natural and the clocks carved into a mountain with fascinating, boring technology. The idea of the cave has been present in the human psyche basically as far back as there's been a human psyche. Over time, as our lifestyles changed, what caves meant to us has also changed. Of course, we used to live in them, but a much later idea which I think is interesting to explore in relation to these two artworks is Plato's allegory of the cave. You might know it. The allegory imagines a group of prisoners chained inside a cave since birth. Behind them is a fire, in front of which performers dance. All the prisoners are able to see are the shadows of the performers cast on the cave wall in front of them. Knowing nothing else, they mistake the shadows for true reality. Both Lascaux and the clock deal with abstractions, shadows of reality. The fluid 
vivid paintings on the walls of Lascaux depict the artist's conception of the megafauna as much as their actual appearance. The clock is a device used to measure time, and is, in a way, an abstract representation of the concept of time. This is true for basically all timekeeping devices, but not at the scale that the clock offers. As humans, we can only really deal with abstractions. Our eyes show us a pair of 2D projections of our three-dimensional world. I think it's important, then, that we create abstractions which help us to consider things in a way or on a scale which we might not have done without them. The clock could be seen as a form of performance art, not acted out over minutes by a person, but over millennia by a machine. No one alive today will live to find out if the clock actually does last for 10,000 years. Throughout the course of its performance, the nature of the artwork will change. At some point, the clock will transition from being something thought of as aiming to tick for millennia to something that's already been ticking for millennia. Even if it stops ticking early, its carcass will likely be preserved in the stable climate of the cave as a memento to be discovered by future generations. It's said that futurism says more about the time it was made than about the actual future. I think the fact that we even wanted to build this clock in the first place says things about our culture which we're essentially oblivious to in the same way that fish are oblivious to water. When future people look at the clock and wonder about its ancient creators, they'll make inferences about what we were like. Their culture may be different from ours in ways which are hard to imagine, ways of doing things which seem in inevitable to us may not be the case for them. They might completely misunderstand what our aims were, or unwittingly project their own cultural prejudices onto the clock, just as I'm sure we're doing with the paintings at Lascaux.